Let's hold our Bible in our hands and let's make this confession together. I thank you, Father, that your word has the power to change my life. Today, I give heed to it. I allow it to go into my ears, then into my mind, and then into my spirit. I'm a hearer of the word and a doer of the word. And I'll never be the same. After today, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. John chapter 6, verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him. The Message Bible actually says, This he said to stretch him. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the man sat down in number about 5,000. Now Matthew's account of this says that it was 5,000 men and then women and children beside. So we can safely say there were probably about 12,000 people here. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled the twelve baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. So here we see Jesus doing a miracle with five loaves and two fish that were giving given by a young lad who was here at the, um, at the sermon, at the message that Jesus is preaching. So they usually fed 12,000 people with these five loaves and two fish. Now they took up how many baskets of fragments? 12, 12 baskets of fragments. Who do you think those baskets of fragments went to? The little boy. Some, some people say, well, 12, 12 baskets of fragments for the 12 disciples. But the 12 di- disciples didn't give anything into this. It was the little boy. The Bible says, as you give, it will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Will men give to you? And so here, this little boy who gave up his lunch. And I don't know if there were any other lunches there. He might have been the only person who was willing to give it. But then Jesus took it and multiplied it. Now I want you to go with me back to Matthew, the book of Matthew chapter 15. Because anywhere from one day to one week later, Jesus does it again. In fact, in fact Matthew records what we just read in Matthew. Then uh, That's in Matthew 15. Then you go over to Matthew 16. Or that was in Matthew 14, and then in Matthew 15, is that what I said? Matthew 15, 29. This is after he fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Jesus departed from there. Matthew 15, 29. You have it? Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then a great multitude came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, the mute, the maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few little fish. 
So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish, and he gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples, and his disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled and took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now those who were eight were 4,000 men besides women and children. So now we see that, that one day to a few days later, Jesus does the exact same miracle again. Now the disciples are getting smart. Because this time, they brought their own loaves and fish. He asked them, how many do you have? And they said, well, we've got seven loaves and a few small fish. It's interesting how when we look at the bigness of what the need is, and we look at how little we have, we capitalize sometimes on the little bit that we have rather than the bigness of God. Because they didn't just say, we have we have seven loaves and some fish. They said we have seven loaves and a few little fish. Don't focus on how little you have. Focus on the vastness of God. How big God is. And what God can do in your life. And so the seven loaves and a few little fish, as if the size of the fish mattered, fed 4,000 men plus women and children, easily 9,000 people. Now, they took up seven baskets of fragments, right? And who did those fragments go to? This is not a trick question. They went to the disciples. It went to whoever sowed it. That's where the harvest went. And so here we have the the seven baskets left over, and the disciples watch this little boy. You know, sometimes people will see somebody get a harvest and go, well, they don't need all that. What's this little boy going to do with 12 baskets left over? It's not a question of who needs it. It's a question of who sows for it. I could preach on that for the rest of the day. So, so here the disciples are getting smart and they're saying, there's no little boy that's going to get our harvest next time. Of course, he had more faith than the disciples did because he got 12 baskets, they only got seven. Anyway, so now, I want you to go with me. Uh, for me, it's on the same page. Actually, Matthew 16, the next chapter. And now, this is just a couple days later. And there, the disciples are... Uh, Going, they have gone across the sea with Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, verse 5. Now, when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It's because we've taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it you don't understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So they're walking along, and all of a sudden, they realize that it's getting to be lunchtime, and they forgot to bring any bread, and Jesus is trying to teach them this spiritual lesson about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he said, he's talking about leaven. And how that the Pharisees and Sadducees and their religious mind can poison them and they need to beware. And they said, oh, he's talking about, he's mad at us because we didn't bring food again. We're going to have to look for a little boy because we didn't bring food. And Jesus overheard him and he said, here's what he says. He says, guys, you're missing the whole, I'm not talking about food. I'm not talking about bread. I'm talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But if I were talking about food, which I'm not, but if I were talking about bread and you not bringing bread, do you not remember the 12 baskets that were left over when we fed the 5,000? Do you not remember the seven baskets that were left over when we fed the 4,000? Now listen, he did not say, do you not remember the miracle? He said, do you not remember the baskets that were left over? 
See, we're, we remember the miracle. And what we would have expected Jesus to say is, hey guys, why are you worried about bread? Do you not remember that I, made, I fed 12,000 people with five loaves and two fish? He didn't say that. He could have said, do you not remember when I fed the 9,000 people, 4,000 men, not counting women and children, with seven loaves and those few small fish? Do you not remember that? He didn't say that. He said, do you not remember the baskets that were left over? He never even mentioned the miracle. He's not asking, do you remember the miracle? He's asking, do you remember the harvest? Whenever we sow into the kingdom of God, there are two things that take place. And most of us are only focused on one. There are two things that may take place. There's a miracle and there's a harvest. When you sow, there is a miracle and there's a harvest. The miracle says, whatever you sow, that will you also reap. Do you need a miracle? Do you need for God to do something significant in your life? Then I have a word from God for you. You need to sow. You need to sow. Give and it shall be given unto you. You need to sow. I hear people say all the time, listen, God is not a big slot machine in the sky. However, we do sow based on his promises and expect the harvest his word declares. There's a difference. If you tell your child, if you clean your room, I'm taking you to Disney World, then when they clean their room, they should expect to go to Disney World. And if they're asking you when you're going, then you don't punish them for having an entitlement mentality because you promised. So when we sow, God is not some big Santa Claus or some big genie in the sky, but when God says, if you'll do this, I'm going to do that, then he's a good father. Don't you love that song we sing, he's a good, good father? He's a good, good father. And so when we sow, when we do what he says, then we should expect him to do what he says. The miracle, whatever you sow, you will also reap. So if you, need, if you need the promises of God to come to pass in your life, you need to sow. And listen to me, every Christian believes in giving to get. I'm just, I get fed up to hear when I people, when I people, you know, well, that's one of those churches where they believe in giving to get. You give to God because you expect something from him. Look at me, every Christian believes in giving to God to get something from him. Every single Christian does. You look like you're in shock. What about your salvation? You gave your life to Christ because Jesus said if you would do that, he'd give you eternal life. You gave him your life because you expected something from him. What kind of God would he be if, if when you left this world and you went to the pearly gates and he said, no, nah, I was just kidding. Or you, you got to the pearly gates and God says, so you're just up here to get something from me. Is that it? Well, actually, yes. Because you said, if I would surrender my life to you, that you would give me eternal life. So don't, how many of you expect eternal life? How many of you have given your life to Christ and now you expect when you go to heaven to have eternal life and spend eternity with him? That is called you gave your life to Christ because you expected to get something from him and you didn't initiate that, he did. Every Christian believes in it. So I say so big and believe God's word for miraculous manifestations of your faith. Now, the harvest, on the other hand, whenever you sow into the kingdom of God, two things that take place. First of all, there's a miracle. But the harvest, on the other hand, is the residual effect that goes beyond your immediate miracle to change the life of thousands. For the boy, he looked past the feeding of the 12,000 to the 12 baskets. See, a harvest is something that lasts past, lasts past your immediate need. And every seed that you sow has a miracle and a harvest. Everybody say, a miracle and a harvest. And so the miracle is meeting the immediate need. What is the immediate need? I sowed because I needed for God to bless me. And so, praise God, the need was met. And we get focused on the miracle, and we don't realize that past that, past feeding the 9,000, past feeding the 12,000, there is a harvest that goes past the immediate need. 
for the disciples looking past feeding of the 4,000 men, not counting women and children, to the seven baskets, a harvest that lasts past the immediate need. I want to ask you a question. What was the harvest on the last seed that you sowed? Not the miracle. What was the harvest? It's very quiet in this Episcopal church. <laughs> what was the harvest on the last seed that you sowed? When God gives you a seed to sow, he has two things on his mind. Meeting the need and the harvest. The miracle. And we hear about the miracles all the time. I sowed a seed and my bills were paid. I got the job. I got the car. My property sold. My son came home. My marriage was healed. My debt was canceled. We hear that all the time and praise God for it. Hello? All of us, and you know what? And all of us have been to the point where this was as far as we could see. Sure, I'd love to care about everybody else. But right now, if I don't experience a miracle, my life's going to fall apart. So I'm really not interested in the 12 baskets full or the 7 baskets full right now. I just need, they're going to cut off my electricity by Friday. And so right now, I just need, I need help with this immediate need. Many people in this room have been to that point. I've been to that point. But... The love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, and now we're interested in the harvest. Let me try this side. And now we're interested in the harvest. We're interested in the harvest. You know what? You guys are always, I always go to my left side first, so anytime that happens, it's you guys that get the short end of it. So next time, I'm going to turn to them, and when they don't respond, I'll turn to you and say, let me try this side, and you'll get a chance. Now we're interested, listen, the love of God is poured out in our hearts and all of us need to get to the point where it's not just about, uh, you know, I gotta, get, I gotta get my bills paid. I gotta get my car payment in. They're gonna repossess my house. Or we, all, we wanna get past that to the point where what we're consumed with is the harvest, seeing the harvest, reaping a harvest with what we sow. The harvest is building the kingdom of God. Those that sowed into the building that you're sitting right now, that you're sitting in, those who sowed into this building, they received miracles. And we got all kinds of testimonies of miracles of people that sowed into this building right here. One guy, I, and I can remember him. I mean, we're talking 17 years ago, 2000, the year 2000, and I remember it. I still remember the testimonies that came in of the, of the healings and the, and the miracles and the miraculous financial provision because people sowed in to this project. But let me tell you, they didn't just receive miracles, they also received a harvest. Do you realize that since we've had this building, over 5,000 people have made decisions to follow Christ? In this building, do you realize that over 1,500 people have been baptized here in this building since we've been here? And that's the harvest. It wasn't just the miracle of I sowed back then and I got a bill paid. It was the harvest that we were looking for. 50, one, one Sunday, we baptized 50 people. On one Sunday. More than 50 mission teams have been sent to 11 different countries with countless decisions for Christ. The harvest. And the harvest was because of the seed that was sown. And yes, people experienced miracles. But we got past that because the love of God has been poured into our hearts. And this is what we live for, the harvest. Now this word on sowing, I, and I'm, I'm going to step out here in obedience to the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to say some stuff I've never said before. I just said some stuff I've never said before. Well, I want you to listen to me. This word on sowing is not just for those who are having a tough time financially. So often we hear the word about getting a miracle. And really there are many people sitting in here today who don't need a miracle. They're not going to cut off your electricity next week. Actually, you're going to have a nice vacation this year. Two nice cars, nice home, kids are in a good school, you're upwardly mobile, 
things are looking great for you. And so when, we, when you come to church services and people are talking about, you know, if you sow, God's, you know, some of you are having this problem and that problem. And you're sitting, and go, sitting there going, well, really? You know, life is good. It's easy to forget the harvest when we no longer need the miracle. And I've seen that so many times. The family who came to me almost every week to ask me to pray over their offering because they were financially, things were falling apart for them. And they came every week and brought their offering. Not to give it to me. I didn't, I didn't take it. They just said, we're going to give this offering. Would you please pray over this? And sometimes they'd cry because, and they, they, would, they would literally shake and cry because they, they just said, this is our only way out. And they did that for almost a year. And then so all of a sudden, all of a sudden, bam, the floodgates open. He got a job, a really good job. They were coming, we can't believe it. Look at this job. It's just, this is just amazing. And then two weeks later, he got a promotion. It's a miracle. So then the tears stopped and the shaking stopped and the offering stopped and all of that stopped. And a year later, they lost it all. The job, the promotion, they lost a car. And listen, look, look at me for a second. I know some of you feel really queasy about me talking about that, but I want you to listen to me. Was that God punishing them because they didn't bring any more offerings? God's going, where's my offering? No, it's because their offering was what was propelling them forward and their tithes and their offerings was what was keeping the enemy off of their stuff and out of their life and moving them forward. And when they stopped that, it wasn't God punishing them. It was the enemy that began to encroach into, back into their life and begin to eat their life up. It's not God's fault. God wasn't punishing them. God wasn't mad at them. It was their money. They could do with it whatever they wanted. I remember. I remember going through the car seats, going through the sofa, looking for change. When my kids were really small, to, find, to buy milk and bread for my kids. I remember that. Working two jobs. Connie working two jobs. Trying to make ends meet in a, in a depressed, we lived, first of all, we, it was a depressed economy. Second of all, we lived in a depressed area. And it was just really, really challenging. Electric bills and house payments, believe in God for those. It's heartbreaking when your child comes to you and says, Dad, it's okay, don't, I know things are tight, so uh, all the other kids are getting class rings this year, but you don't have to get me a class ring, I don't need one. I'm I'm fine. That's heartbreaking. That's, that scars you as a parent. I still remember that. That's, that's a terrible feeling. I remember when our offerings were $10, $15, and I remember shaking when we would give them. I remember, I remember with great trepidation and great excitement the first $100 offering my wife and I ever gave. I remember it. There was a little part of us that said, can we really do this? Are we really going to do this? And then there, but there was a big part that said, this is the best thing ever. We're given $100 in the offering. I mean, it was great. Now, this week, I had no problem with any of those things. I had no problem with paying my electric bill, no problem with taking care of any of my obligations. If that kid wants a class ring now, I'll buy it for him. God has blessed us. And now we're sowing for the harvest. Now, I don't ever tell you about anything that we do because I'm trying to impress you. Listen, there are people in this church that give more money than we do. We're not the biggest givers in the church anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Last week, last week in the offering, my wife and I gave 
to the building fund, not our tithe, for the building fund. We gave $4,000. There are a lot of people in this church that make more money than we do. Wow, Pastor, you must make a lot of, and that was, that was one, of, that's not our whole building thing. In fact, I probably should tell you the whole thing, but I, I'm not going to. I don't want you to focus on that, and I'm not, I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to impress something on you. And that is that when my wife and I got married, I was making $1.89 an hour, and I didn't even make $4,000 the first year that we got married. And last week, I gave $4,000 in an offering. Why? Why? Because I'm focused on the harvest. I'm focused on seeing people. I've gotten past, oh God, how am I going to pay my electric bill? And now I'm focused on the harvest. And let me tell you that you do get to the point when you get focused on the harvest that God, help me Jesus, nobody get mad at me. I'm just preaching what the Holy Spirit's telling me. to. There, there, there comes a point where God is no longer impressed with the $10 offerings and the $15 offerings. And the $100 offerings. There's, there comes a point where you grow past that. To the point because God's interested in a harvest. And God's blessing you not just so you can get your needs met. God is blessing you because he sees a harvest. He sees 5,000 people coming into the kingdom of God. And he wants you to fund it. Thank you for that overwhelming response. Again, I want to ask you. What was the harvest on the, seed, the last seed that you sowed? I'm not asking about the miracle. I'm asking about the harvest. What was the harvest on the last seed that you sowed? Don't just increase to the point that you no longer need a miracle. Grow past the miracle into the harvest. Listen, some of you should be asking some questions you're not asking about the harvest. Some of you should be saying, coming up to me and saying, hey, I'm a big giver in this church, and I want to know how many people made decisions for Christ last month. Are you all okay? Hey, I'm a big giver in this church. I want to know why we're not baptizing more people. You know, last month we didn't baptize anybody. I want to know why. Because I want to know about the harvest on the seed that I'm sowing. How many missionaries are we sending to Costa Rica? When can I find out about the harvest there? People should be asking that because we're not just giving to get a miracle anymore. We're giving because we want to see the harvest. Now, this word on sowing is not just for those who are having a tough time. So often we hear the word about getting a miracle and really we don't need a miracle. But in fact, some of us are doing very well. And the truth is, many pastors don't want to talk about this to those of you who are doing well at the risk of offending you. But we must. Why? First of all, it's easy to forget the harvest when we no longer need the miracle. Second of all, the Bible instructs pastors to teach you how to give. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Turn to your neighbor and say, I really am okay with this. I'm just thinking a lot. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17. When you have it, say, I have it. Teach those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Teach them to do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. And us as pastors, we spend all of our time talking to, to people who are in need and need a miracle. And what here, Paul is telling the pastor Timothy, you need to teach the people who are past the need of miracle stage to lay up treasure in eternal life. He said, he said that you're to instruct them to do four things. To go after God. Oh, the Message Bible. I, you know what? I want to read this to you out of the Message Bible. It says, tell those rich in this world's wealth, not to be full of themselves and obsessed with money, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them to go after God who piles on all the riches we could ever manage. Who's believing God for that? 
Tell them to go after God who piles on all the riches we could ever manage to do good, to be rich in helping others, to be extravagantly generous. If they do that, they'll build a treasury that will last, gaining life that is truly life. Amen. So I am to instruct you to go after God who piles on all the riches we could ever manage to do good, to be rich in helping others, and to be extravagantly generous. So we're to, t- we're to teach on that as pastors. Paul told us that we should, and sometimes we don't because we don't want to offend anybody who might be doing well. And we have a lot of people in this church that are doing well. It's okay to say, I'm one of them. There are a lot of people in this church that are doing well. And Paul says, if you're doing well, then you need to heap up treasures that when you do that, he can give you more than you can manage. One of the reasons, you know what? One of the reasons you're doing well is because you've managed what you have well. And Paul says, if you'll be generous, that God will give you more than you can manage. I'm interested in that myself, actually. Why? Why do we talk not just to those who are, who are in dire need, but why do we talk also about those who are blessed? First of all, it's easy to forget the harvest when we no longer need the miracle. Second of all, the Bible instructs pastors to teach you how to give. And thirdly, you may need a miracle when you least expect it. Go with me to Luke chapter 7, and we'll wrap this up. Luke chapter 7. Y'all okay? Luke chapter 7, verse 1. You got it? it. Now, when Jesus concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered at Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the time for whom he should do this was deserving. For the one, I apologize, for the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. There's a whole teaching on the authority of the kingdom that's here. But I want you to see something. That here is a centurion who has a servant who is sick, and he is sent to Jesus to come and heal him. And Jesus, at first, doesn't go. This is really interesting because they go to Jesus, and they tell him about it, and when when they heard about Jesus, they went to him, and they pleaded, the Bible says that they pleaded for Jesus to come and heal him. And you know what Jesus does? Nothing. So the next verse, it says they came to Jesus and they begged him earnestly. You know what Jesus did? Nothing. The, the, Jesus doesn't move. And then they said, the guy built us a church. And it says, then Jesus went with them. Look at me. This centurion paid for the whole church. This is a Roman soldier, by the way. He's not Jewish. Doesn't say he's not a Christian. He apparently had heard about Jesus because when he heard about Jesus, he sent somebody to bring Jesus to heal his servant. But this centurion built the whole church. Not just, hey, here's here's a thousand bucks. Hope this helps you. He built the whole thing. You know, some of the most, sometimes the most religious people are the stingiest people in the church. Then Jesus went. Listen, you can't buy a miracle from God. Doesn't matter how much money you give. You can't buy a miracle from God. You can't buy what you need from God. Jesus is involved in our lives because of what he did on the cross. But we're at the point where God is asking us, what are we building with our lives? What is the harvest of our lives? You can grow to the point that the harvest comes before the miracle. That's what happened here. The harvest came before the miracle. 
It wasn't, I need a miracle, so I think I'll build a church. It was, he built the church because he loved God's people. So I want to ask you again, what is the harvest on the seed that you've sown? What's the harvest? Not the miracle. Praise God. For, everybody say, praise God for the miracles. The question I want to ask you is, what's the harvest? What is the harvest on the seed that you're going to sow today? We've called this campaign, before I ever knew that I was going to preach this message, we called this campaign Upgrade, and the tag nine's not up there, but it should be because on your brochures it says, Upgrade, Imagine the Harvest. And I want you to imagine the harvest on your seed when we build this. I'm asking you to sow toward this. I'm asking you to help us all together as a church to build this. And I'm asking you to imagine the harvest with us. That 5,000 decisions becomes 25,000 decisions in your lifetime here at Living Word. That 1,500 baptisms becomes 5,000 baptisms at the time that you're here at Living Word. That 50 mission teams becomes 500 mission teams here at Living Word. All because you, wherever you are in your ability to give were generous and you were looking at the harvest would everybody stand with me please I want you to close your eyes with me right now when everyone just to stand and close your eyes and I want you to imagine with me the harvest I want you to imagine the harvest that your seed is going to create the harvest when people See what God has used you to build here. And people begin, I want you to see the cars pulling into the parking lot to come to the new church. You realize that our community doesn't know we're here. When we build this, they're gonna, they all want to see what the new church looks like on the inside. And we give them an opportunity to find life in Christ. People won't be coming here because it's a funeral home, because it's a retirement home. They'll be coming here because that big cross tells them, I can find life in Christ here. That's what happens because of your seed. Say this after me. Father, thank you that you've blessed me. Thank you that you've blessed me to the point where now I'm focused on the harvest. And I know the seed that I give today it's going to affect that harvest in a big way. I name my seed souls for the kingdom. I thank you for the miracles that my seed produces. But today I'm looking past the 5,000 to the 12 baskets. And I thank you, God, for the miracles, but more than that for the harvest that's being created by the seed that I sow today. 5,000 decisions since we've been in this building become 25,000 over the next 15 years. 1,500 baptisms. Come on, shout this out, folks. 1,500 baptisms become 5,000 baptisms over the next 15 years. 50 mission teams become 500 mission teams over the next 15 years. And this church accomplishes everything that you've called us to do because of the seed that I sow today. In Jesus' name, amen.